Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, you're joined here by your boy, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. And as usual, we want to give a massive shout out to our incredible sponsors who help make the show happen. Seeds Here Now, your number one seed bank in the industry. A guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination, with all the hottest breeders and the latest drops. Why would you go anywhere else? If you finish a grow and you're not satisfied with the end product, hit them up. They'll make it right. They only stock the highest quality breeders. And I know they got some fire packs from your boy Heavy Days there. Check them out before they're gone, guys. Massive shout out to Seeds Here Now, your number one stop for all your genetic needs. But in order to get your garden pumping on all cylinders and producing the best crop to date, you got to make sure your room's dialed in. To do that, check out our friends at Pulse Sensors, number one sensors and integrated hubs in the game, measuring all of the variables, PPD, VPD, temperature, humidity, dew point, all the extra variables you don't consciously track to help ensure your next crop is the best to date. Whether you're running a single tent, a single room, or a multi-state operation, Pulse Sensors are the number one in the game, and they've just recently released the Pulse Hub, a central unit to integrate all of their monitors to make sure that your rooms are the best they can possibly be. Massive thank you to Pulse Sensors. We appreciate you so much. Likewise, you've got to keep your garden pest and pathogen free. And to do that, you've got to check out our friends at Copit. These guys are the world leaders in sustainable biocontrol solutions for pests and disease. If you're battling spider mites, check out their new Spidex Vital Plus sachets. These are new Persimilis breeding sachets that release predator mites into your crop consistently over a period of several weeks, providing you with sustained spider mite control. Now you don't have to spread carrier material through your garden just to introduce predator mites. Just hang the sachets on your crop, let the Persimilis walk out and do the work for you. Trust me guys, you don't want to have to go up against a spider mite infestation without Spidex Vital Plus. These are truly the best predators in the game. I promise once you use it, you'll see the quality, you'll never go back. Massive shout out to Copet. Likewise, you got to check out our friends at Organics Alive. If you're growing organic and want to use high quality powdered organic fertilizers, you simply cannot go past Organics Alive. These guys truly walk the walk and talk the talk. They have been picking up cups left, right and centre with growers all around the country sweeping categories using their products. That is the ultimate testament in my opinion if home growers are winning competitions using their products. The proof is in the pudding guys. No matter what stage of the plant cycle you're at, veg, transition, flower, in need of micronutrients or a very specific sort of boost in late flower, they've got it. You've got to check out Organics Alive, guys. Truly one of the best in the industry. We're super stoked to be working with them because we know how amazing their products are. Used in heaps of breeder gardens that we have on the show. Again, check them out. Organics Alive, massive thank you. Massive shout out for supporting the show. Finally, a massive shout out to the entire crew at Dynavap. These guys make some of the best vaporizers on the game. I'm really passionate about this one because they help me to get off combustion and smoking bongs. If you have any concerns about your respiratory health, or heck, if you just want to try a different mode of ingestion, maybe try to get a better flavor hit, you've got to check out the Dynavat. These guys' units are cheap, they're incredibly well designed, and most importantly, they're very customizable. You can take your vape game to the next level, getting insane terps, all while retaining the potency you'd expect of a combustion or a bong. Truly, I was smoking bongs for over 10 years. I'm now vape only. Massive shout out to Dynavap. They're one of the best in the industry and we owe them a massive thank you. Shout out again, Dynavap. Massive thanks for supporting the show. Finally, a quick little mention to our Patreon gang, truly the lifeblood of the show. If you want to get early access to episodes, unheard and unreleased interviews, as well as going in the running to get amazing genetics each month and fortnight, come on, check out the Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. We do live smoke with heavy sessions every fortnight and give away heaps of swag every month. Come check it out. We love you, the Patreon gang. Thank you so much. We are so appreciative. And on this one today, we got a fun one. The first ever with the man himself, Marty, TK Origins, Florida native, creator of TK, OG, here to talk some history, some 
plans for the future. So much more. Let's get into it. Alrighty, gang. Thanks for joining us. We're back for another one. And on today's episode, we have an old school weed head, a surfer, an incredible artist, a Florida native. A big, big thank you to Marty of Origins TK for coming on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. I know you and I talked probably five years ago about doing this. Yeah, look, it, all good things come. They just take a bit of time. Uh, I, I'm grateful to have you on the show today. The first thing I wanted to ask you, as we've been asking all guests recently, what have you been smoking on lately? Uh, that's a good question. I always have uh, Triangle Kush and OG Kush, obviously, around. Um, lately, I've been going through some new flavors here at the Legal Grow that I've been working at, stuff that I made from seed. Um, but the most recent thing I've been smoking on and enjoying is actually some Colombian gold uh Panama red that a friend of mine gave me a little jar of and actually it brings back super good memories from this strand of Florida we had in the early 2000s called Juicy Fruit uh which I always thought was a Thai Afghani cross I want to say but whatever is in this particular bud has that exact same like terps and aroma after you smoke it and it leaves that splingering smell in the air you know it looks like it too it has very orange hairs on top of like green flower and on little spindly um, sticks, kind of, you know, it has a very similar look. So I've been enjoying that lately. That, help, that also answered the, the question you usually ask people about sativas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Is that the um, the lumbo you posted? Uh, yeah, exactly. I don't know why they call it that, but um, it's basically, I think it came from Alaska, I want to say, people have hunted up there or somewhere. And my buddy here up in near Jacksonville had it, Old City Seeds. And uh, yeah, he came through the other day and I gave him a pack of seeds or two to look for some males and he gave me a jar of that. So that was a nice gift. Ah, that's beautiful. Did you get a chance to try much of those like Mexican and South American sativas growing up? Um, As far as the Mexican goes, not per se. Like in South Florida, there is so much brickweed that would come to Florida and for some reason, I couldn't install a house of that stuff, but a lot of my friends were like moving truckloads of that stuff. I had friends who made 50, 60 grand a pop doing like one deal with like a bunch of Mexi brick. And uh, like I said, I could barely even sell an house I had to see much less a pound or more. Um, we smoked it early, early on as kids here and there when there's nothing else around, but it definitely wasn't my favorite. Um, you know, I, I know obviously there's some good ones that came from parts of Mexico. But, uh, yeah, nothing like these Colombian and, and Panama that I'm smoking on right now that I've ever seen. Now, as far as uh, Asian, uh, back then, as a kid, when I first moved to Pompano, I had met a group of friends, and we would actually pitch in once in a while to buy, like, an house between us from this guy that had a connection, and he called it Hawaiian Haze. Or, no, sorry, Hawaiian Skunk. And it was just some of the stinkiest bud ever, and it was super fluffy, would fill a giant bag. And uh, the guy that was going to get it, the guy that was selling it lived in a high-rise condominium building full of old people. And the people, the guy that we knew, he was older than us, but he knew the guy and would go over there and get an ounce. But back, this is back before seal meals or jars were being used. So he would always come back with like a lick seal bag with like this big fluffy ounce. And the stories were always about some old people that get in the elevators with them and just give these crazy looks. And probably within a year or so after that connection, basically I think the guy got kicked out of the condo or maybe he got busted or something. So that was like, we lost that connection. But that was a that was definitely some sort of sativa, a hazy type stuff, like really, really funky and different, had lots of colors. Uh, one of my good friends to this day, actually, Angelo, he goes by Sea Green Lounge um, on Instagram. We were, He was one of the ones who would pitch in on that stuff with me when we were probably like 14, 15, or 15 years old, I'd say. Yeah, super young. Oh, epic. What was the effect like of that Hawaiian skunk? Well, it's been many years, but uh, obviously, um, I just remember it was, to this day, I would say it's in the top 10 weed we've ever, I've ever smoked, um, varieties wise. I don't know. Uh, I can't say exactly what the buzz was like, but I'm pretty sure we all loved it a lot. And, you know, it was like, as kids, it was just like some of the best stuff we'd ever seen. And still to this day, like I said, if I had a bag of that stuff, people would be like, what the hell is that? Um, it was really exotic and I have no clue if it was actually Hawaiian or whatever it was. That's what it was called. Oh, epic, epic. Let me, um, let me take you back for a moment because you, you referenced, you know, you've always got some TK, you got some OG Kush on hand. That's, uh, exactly what I imagined. I wanted to ask you, do you have a favorite out of the two? 
Um, on any given day, not really. I pretty much smoke them equally. I, I use pretty much a bong hit person. So I'm always doing bong hits one after the other. And, and basically, I never really choose one a day. It's pretty much mixing stuff up like a salad all day long. I got seven or eight different varieties and pretty much smoking through on a regular basis. Um, as far as triangle, I'm a lot more familiar with that because that's the one that I've had, the cut that me and Craig and my friends have had for years. Um, and the OG Kush, I only found out about five years ago when I went public and then met Josh and a bunch of people that were, you know, involved with the OG Kush. And that's when we kind of tied all those stories together. But, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're on their day. They're pretty equal. Um, the triangle seems to be a little bit more finicky these days than it used to be. Like I used to always pop, we used to use 600 watt lights back when I was growing it mostly. And I don't know if it just like, like less light, like it does. Um, but once you get it under thousands, it just seems like it's a little bit harder to get it, you know, to where it's perfectly tasty and the way we used to always get it. Um, so yeah, I would say the triangle if I had to pick one, because like I said, it got a lot more time with her and OG Kush, I've only had her for like five years. So. Wow, there's a there's a lot to go into there. The first one I want to touch on, I've seen a lot of people posting recently about how they feel OG comes out way better under HPS than LED. Has this been your experience? Absolutely. Um, it's been definitely tricky with the LEDs. Uh, like back, you know, when I first started, I learned using checkerboard back in the day. We used to use HPS and halide, um, so or sodium and halide, sorry. And uh, we do a checkerboard setup. So actually where I'm at now doing stuff legally, they have a few rooms that are checkerboarded and that seems to be some of the best quality in the building, I, I, I believe anyway. As far as LEDs go, um, you can get super beautiful looking nugs, but there's just a little something that's missing. Um, and like, it really, you have to really dial it in. I've had a couple of batches that come out super good, but it's not consistent. It's like, you know, like one out of three will come out the way you want it. So it's definitely something to do with the LEDs that's missing still. Maybe something to do with like a little UV light or some UVB light that's missing from the LEDs still. I know some companies are throwing bars in now and, and adding that stuff. So we'll see if it progresses more and they get better. And I've also seen some really good batches come out of, you know, when they do come out good out of the LEDs, they do come out good. So it's, it's definitely possible. Um, it's just for some reason, it's more consistent in the HPS. Yeah, interesting. Okay, certainly a, a sentiment I've heard echoed by a few people. So that's that's something I'll have to take in. I, I wanted to quickly ask because you mentioned that you know the TK is a little more finicky now than before, and on past episodes we've discussed in detail how the same is said quite a lot about the chem dog. I wonder, have you seen any other like the common thing with the chem dog we hear is like it takes longer to root, the flavor is not as strong anymore, it's a little less vigorous. Would you say that you see those same sort of reductions, or is it just maybe in one specific area and less in others? Um, it definitely roots fine still. Um, and bed is good still. I mean, it's a thing is just because the last few years I've been using LEDs and like the times I've grown it in the last few years at home or in Central America where we're living, it was, you know, just a little harder to figure out the LEDs compared to what I remember. So, but then we've had a couple of batches come out of this grow with the uh, HPS recently that like went way back and tasted the way they should and stuff. So we even had a couple of tests that, uh, you know, we never did lab testing back in the day, but now we're, I'm seeing lab testing on these things and we've ranged between 19% THC to 32% THC, you know, depending on how good the batch come out. And uh, so, yeah, I've seen that hit 32 actually recently and that was one of the tastier ones we've had yet for some reason you know the, the rooms we have are pretty much are all a little bit different one room would produce better than the other we have two leds there's uh there's 11 rooms total at the girl i'm at now and uh out of those 11 there's two leds and then the rest are hps but then some have checkerboard with um halide and some are just all hps so each room has its own little personality i guess you could say so some of the rooms definitely put off more fire than others. Um, and since I've been there, basically it's been a, almost a, almost a year now. I was working with these guys here in Florida and we had a hurricane. Ian came through last year and it was right about before I got to launch my brand and uh, basically it wiped out power and flooded the entire zone. It wiped out the entire coastline where the storm hit. And it basically the eye went right over the grove we were at. 
and power went out, the cameras went out, the backup generators went out. And so nobody could even get to the place for three days. So that definitely set the whole building into a tailspin and a lot of stuff had to get killed. Actually funny because most of the moms um, from the West Coast that they had, all the genetics from the West Coast actually had a hard time with the power being offered there too. But some of the stuff I brought from the East Coast, like TK and OG, for, for example, were <laughs> they actually survived the power outage, like no problem. <laughs> But most of the babies that we had going that were getting ready to go and flower um, with my brand or whatever, they pretty much all died and we had to reset everything. It took another six months to get up and going, actually. What what, a, what an incredible testament to the, the power of the TK and the OG. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. So, I, I, um, I wanted to ask while we're on the topic, what style of growing do you do? Well, I've always been uh, more of a salt grower because here in Florida, we were always indoor. I mean, we didn't really have the luxury like everyone out west does of growing outdoor because first off, the humidity. Second of all, back in the day, the, they had drones and they had clear helicopters and they'd go out and, you know, do like sweeps with their helicopters and find like every single plant outdoors. They could, you know, out, it seemed like every plant that would be outdoors would get found. I don't know how they did it, but I tried a few times with some patches here and there and like, we would crawl through hedges and bushes and put little plants in the ground. We'd come back a couple days later and there'd be ATC tracks that would go, you know, quad runner tracks right to the spot where they were and they would cut them down before they were even growing. So we never had a chance to outdoor, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, mm. I've had a couple of batches here and there in Central America outdoor, but just like experimental and like five gallon pots and soil. So my whole life has pretty much been indoor with hydro and this. As far as indoor, I prefer salts, obviously. That, you know, I've tried just actually, I'm smoking, I'm just trying it right now, which came from Organics Alive, which I'm enjoying. So I'll probably use that again in the future. Um, but yeah, we've always, that's basically how I learn. And that's basically better for indoors. I always learn you know, as far as like living soil and stuff. Like that's more, I always thought it was more for maybe in a bed or if you're growing, in a, you know, big greenhouse or outdoor plants in like giant containers where, you know, the the living soil actually starts living and benefits from everything you're doing to it versus, you know, an indoor situation, you're usually growing in small pots. Um, so yeah, we've always been, I've done rock wool, I've done cocoa, I've done clay pellets. That's basically how I learned years ago. And, you know, lots of different nutrient brands over the years and we've always produced fire weed. I smoke it myself all the time. Um, so yeah, happy with it. What an epic answer and massive shout out to Organics Alive, one of our sponsors. That's so cool to hear you growing a batch and smoking it. It's good. Yeah, it's a group of surfers too. So we actually, I met with a couple of them and uh, actually at the Emerald Cup this last year I went and met with Eric from Organics Alive. He's a super cool guy and uh, we plan on hanging out again soon once it comes to Florida. So definitely a good hookup. That's epic. Yeah, my um, interactions with Eric have been really awesome as well. I wanted to quickly ask for our listeners out there, you got any tips for growing the TK or the OG? I think in the past, I've heard a lot of people say like whatever cow mag you'd normally use, like double or triple it when you're growing an OG. What's your take? Any tips for the listeners? Well, me personally, when I was growing my best TK ever back in the day, we were being as simple as can be and I wasn't really adding any cow mag um, this was under 600 watt sodiums. I was using flood and drain tables. This is for a year that is probably 10 years. And we had the same brand I learned on actually, um, was a two part liquid called Rockwell formula one. And they stopped making it years ago. I think sunlight supply bought the company out and then they changed the formula and it was never the same again. And then they just got faded out. But that's what I learned on basically all the way back in like 1990, 91. Um, and I used that stuff all the way till I got in trouble. Um, in 2011. So I know the company has gone away since then, but that was the two part. I never had any, I mean, basically I would find, you know, there's all these like snake oils. I was called them, you know, at the hydro stores that were $50 a bottle for this, that, and the other. And I tried a few things here and there, some bud swell and, you know, different products, cool bloom and different botanic airs and different, ad, you know, additives, but I always had the best results from just being simple with it. I thought, you know, like just the two part nutrient, the right pH and just that 600 watt lights, which they seem to love. And in Florida, we always grew, you know, I, my style of growing was always like in a house and bedrooms or a garage where you didn't really have the luxury of having 
mass AC systems added, you know, unless you install it yourself. So a lot of times you just run your central AC unit. So your house could only get so cold, your bedroom's going to get so cold unless you add AC. But a lot of times I would do like two or three lights per room and you're going to get, you know, your, your house is cold as you're living in it. So it seemed like the best patches, obviously for years, are always in the winter months in Florida because it would actually get pretty chilly in Florida, especially central Florida, getting the 40s and 50s at times, sometimes even lower. So those nights, that time of year, um, for whatever reason, TK always thrived. And that was like when the tastiest, stickiest, dankest batches would always come out. In the summer months, you get bigger plants, obviously a little bit warmer, and they just never taste as good. Sometimes they'd be a little more bland or almost like cardboardy. Um, you could just almost tell it was just like, you know, it, it, it took time, but over time we just realized that it was, they liked the cooler temperatures and I started adding mini splits and smaller like window units in my room and it really set it off like year round where it was always good. That's awesome to hear. Uh, I, I haven't heard about it growing in ultra cold conditions. Have you ever got the TK to go purple or is it just pretty much a green plant? Uh, you can get the leaves may have turned dark. But like I've seen, I gave it to a friend of mine in uh, Michigan who actually grew it last year. And I guess it gets super cold up there. Obviously, I don't know how cold his room got, but it looked as dark as I've ever seen it. Um, But down here, no, we always had it. It was always green um, for the most part. Like you might get some coloring on the leaves during the winter months I was talking about when it got cold enough. You get your room down to like 55 or 60 sometimes if you tried. Um, And, you know. Basically, the lights on, it wouldn't be that cold, but at night, you know, that's when you wanted to have it really cold back then, it seemed like. Um, so, whatever combination we used to do in the winter months here, it just made that stuff taste like magic. It was some of the best weed ever. And I tried it warm, I tried it cold, I tried it, you know, all, all different ranges, but like it definitely likes it cooler. Not cold, cold. And it definitely likes some warmth in the beginning to get going, obviously. You know, like that's what we thought that we'd do it now. Um, get it growing for like the first month kind of warm especially with leds you got to have some warmth up to like 84 85 degrees even on the leds um but after the way you know halfway through we pretty much start dropping it down i, I would anyway um all the way down probably like say 70 for daytime temp high and 60 to 65 for nighttime would be a good target and that always seems to be a magic formula for it Ah, okay. Beautiful. And out of curiosity, what's like the single most memorable batch of TK you've had? And do you remember how it was grown? Uh, well, like I was saying, most of the time I grew it, I was using clay rocks um, and doing flood and drain. And then at some point I switched over to drippers and it just made the plants a lot thicker and, and just blew up actually. So I kind of like got out of the whole flood and drain thing and switched to drippers at that point. And then, then you started learning a little bit more about prop steering and drying them out a little bit more at the end. And, and it seemed like there were some batches that were just incredible from, from that. Um, There's a couple of times timers went out and the plants almost died on the stick and they just ended up being like, oh my God, what happened? It got so good. So that's about the time you started learning, you know, how to like start your plants and basically help bring out more flavors and oils. And, and the, you know, the cooler temperatures combined basically was a nice combination for sure. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I want to talk more because you, you mentioned um, some seed projects a few questions ago. But before we get there, let's go back and set the scene because I know everyone who's listening is really keen to hear exactly what your name is, TK Origins. So, let's go back to the start. What was your first experience with cannabis? Uh, first experience was, uh, I think I was 12 years old, like 1984. Uh, my parents had split up and my dad moved to a nice house on the beach he rented like a few hours north actually book Raton. and my brother and i were still living at my mother's house and we go visit him on the weekends and he apparently had smoked a lot i didn't know it then but um uh, that that trip one of these trips at his house basically i was being nosy and him and my brother were out for the day i guess or doing something and I was going through my dad's room and I stumbled across a change basket on the top of his dresser. And on top of there was this huge roach, um, clamp in a clamp in a roach clip, um, device, like one of those metal clamps. So I knew what, for some reason, what it was, I guess I was in seventh grade at the time and just knew what it was. I knew it was drugs, you know, but I didn't think it was, I wasn't scared of it. But whatever, for whatever reason I did, I found a lighter and got curious and I took it out back on our patio and took a little hit off it, um, put it out right away, all paranoid immediately. 
And I was actually worried immediately, like I was going to get seen by the neighbors. The neighbors going to smell it. It was the smell of the house. My dad was going to see that I smoked some of it. So it just hit me immediately, like paranoia style. And I didn't see weed again for another year until ninth grade. Ah, oh, okay. And and what was that next experience like? Uh, ninth grade, well, for a couple of years in a row, my dad, was, we moved in with my dad and he was running houses every year, moving us from school to school. Um, so ninth grade, I went to this real nice um, high school that was full of surfers and skaters and like all my type of people, basically. And that was, I had just started surfing the year before in eighth grade um, in Boynton Beach. And so I started going to this new school and met a bunch of friends and they all had brothers a little older than them. They were all smoking weed already. And basically, I just kind of ran into it that way again. Like parties or you know, go to like a football game with some of the guys at the school and smoke under the bleachers and stuff like that. Uh, we all skated, started getting into skating at the time. and go to skate parks and built little half pipes in our yards. And um, the whole scene of people were all into smoking weed at the time. So that's basically when I got into it. Ah, and, and do you remember, were there any uh, names associated with the strain back then or was it just like the days where it was like the kind and stuff like that? Yeah, it was definitely no names I remember from back then. The early days, there was always somebody else had it and they would pull it out and roll up a joint or um, had a pipe or something on them. Ah, interesting, interesting. And and you've touched on the surfing aspect, and this was something I wanted to talk to you about because much like the Grateful Dead, I feel like surfing in general is very intertwined with cannabis culture. Was it? Is it one of the cases with the chicken and the egg? Like which one came first for you, the cannabis or the surfing, or was it sort of at the same time? No, I was definitely surfing. I started surfing that year before, like I said, it was eighth grade. Um, I bought my first uh, surfboard out of a pawn shop. And I lived like maybe a mile from the beach in Boynton Beach. So I started going there all the time on the weekends. And my dad was always against me surfing. He always knew that it was like a stoner type sport, you know, and it just maybe because of the Fast Times movies or whatever it was. But he just always frowned on it at first um, for years, actually. So um, I almost like had to do it like secretly. I'd go to the beach, you know, my surfboard type thing. Uh, so, yeah, it was surfing first skating next and then smoking weed pretty much came next after that the uh the holy trio i love it surf skating smoking (laughs) (laughs) yeah no it it is interesting because obviously you know like there's that history of like the brothers of eternal love and their connection with surfing so it is i guess maybe that's partly where your dad got his perception of it from maybe it could be he just always wanted me, me to be a sports player like you know, like either baseball or something, soccer, whatever it was. He had me playing baseball real young and stuff I didn't want to do, basically. And he was always on the TV watching sports growing up, which actually got me to not like those kind of sports too much. <laughs> um, so that's probably what actually led me to surfing and skating to begin with. There you go, right? We tend to rebel from our parents. That's uh, <laughs> that's that's pretty part for the course. So from that second experience when did the penny drop for you that cannabis was something you wanted to get really involved with well let's see ninth grade i was just kind of i wasn't buying or anything yet these guys always had it you know so we would get high with them but um we moved my dad finally bought a house for 10th grade but it was like an hour south of there 45 minutes south of there so we moved from like i said all over the place and i finally got settled in meet a bunch of friends and they moved me to another place like south of there which the waves weren't as good uh at the school i was supposed to go to was all super nice and new so that's the reason he bought the house and then we, we moved there over the summer and they closed that school down so the next thing you know i'm getting shipped to like this crazy public school in the middle of a real bad neighborhood and uh wasn't liking it one bit basically it was like small click of surfers that I met, you know, in that first year. And uh basically we lived close to the beach. So I like that part about it. And he bought a nice house on the water actually. So I enjoyed that. And I guess eventually I started making friends and stuff. So anyway, that first year I met a bunch of kids skating and surfing. And that was probably the year I started actually buying weed. That was actually a group of friends I was talking about earlier, right? We were buying that Hawaiian skunk from the guy. Um and that was actually before I was even driving a car yet. So I was 15. And, uh, yeah, that was the year that I first started buying and selling a little bit of weed here and there. Ah, uh, incredible. So, were, were you just, like, sort of selling and middlemaning it for a while before you started growing? Or what was that progression like to then become a grower? Yeah, definitely. Um, started out just kind of, like, buying it for our personal and stuff. I never thought about growing it or seeing plants until 
years later. But um, actually, at some point when I was, I think I was 16 or 15 or 16 still, someone had given me this thing called a Phototron. And my dad, had a pretty, we moved into a pretty good sized house and the house was like divided in two. And I had my own like room on the other side of the house with my own entrance sliding out his door so I can kind of come and go and sneak in and out of the house easy if I wanted. And my dad was kind of lenient, wasn't very strict with us. Um, it was just me and my brother that lived with him. And he actually had a, a place going on uh, in uh, Acapulco. He had a condo with a couple of friends of his and he would go visit there all the time and leave my brother and, and I and leave me in charge of the house basically. So at some point somebody gave me a Phototron, which was like this little octagon box um, that was like the size of a little mini refrigerator. And all the sides had these like um, tinted windows that you could lift up or slide up and then access the center, which had a bunch of these um, fluorescent lights that were running up the center or along the, the walls. And I think someone gave it to me because it had a fan that had broke on them or something and they didn't want it anymore. So I took it home and stuck it in my little master closet and covered it with like dirty laundry and a surfboard and stuff and actually popped some seeds that I found in some bag of weed. I had no idea what it was, but basically got them going and flowered them out on that little thing. I actually did a couple of batches of it. A couple of my friends I still talk to this day actually will remember that. It's super funny. <laughs> but um, never got caught, pulled it off, threw that thing away at some point. It was pretty much garbage. <laughs> oh, man, the Phototron. That's a blast from the past. I love to hear that. And uh, that's cool that you managed to do a few crops from those seeds. Uh, do, you, do you have any memories at all about like if you had to guess based on the structure or the smells, like looking back, what do you think those genetics might have been? Uh, I really don't remember. They're tiny plants. They probably, you know, they might have been like quarter ounces or something that came out of there <laughs> per plant. If uh, I might have done like three or four plants each batch, and you know, it was just just it's kind of like a little hobby learning thing. It's almost like a if I see if I can get away with it here at my house, in my house kind of thing, maybe. <laughs> uh, look, kudos to you. That that's epic. And, and you mentioned that um, you know the property in Acapulco. Did you ever get to try any cool weed down there? Um, I never actually been to Acapulco myself. My dad was going down there all the time. He would always, that's probably the reason my parents separated, I would imagine, because he was going down there partying with his friends and my mom hated it. <laughs> um, so he'd always come back with like knockoff clothes for us. My brother and I, like Levi's jeans and this and polo shirts and this, that, and the other. Um, so no, I never actually spent time in Acapulco. I've been in Mexico three times, different locations surfing, but not to Acapulco. Um, more recently, actually, I've been to southern Mexico, which is probably one of the better surf trips of my life. There you go. Okay, cool. So, so you got into it pretty early. So, you know, how did things progress? Because for anyone who's been following your story online, they'd probably be aware that you were involved in the whole TK story quite young, you know, sort of around 19 to 20s. It sounds like it wasn't too long of a time period before you transitioned into that story. Is that right? Yeah, well, it all started... Um, Actually, going back a year, I was 15, and I wasn't driving yet, and I was skipping school one day, and we lived on like a dead-end street where my dad had his own job where he'd come and go anytime he wanted, so I never knew when he would back out of the driveway. I'm supposed to be going to the bus stop, but I'd always sneak out my surfboard and try to like run down the street where he wouldn't see me, and that's how I would skip school and get away with it. Um, so one day, I'm walking down the street with my surfboard, trying to like avoid my dad, and I get to the end of my street and my neighbor from across the street was a surfer also. And he was a little older than, he was like 10 years older than me. And he pulled up in his little Mustang and honked the horn and asked me if I wanted to go to the beach with him. And I was like, looked and see, he had surfboards in the back. I was like, oh yeah. So I jump in. And then that day was basically the day that I would meet my whole crew later on. Um, that was like the day that would change my life. So we went to uh, the beach that day, a beach a little further north that I normally would go to. I lived in Pompano. He took me to Deerfield Beach, like the town north of there. And there was a pier there and basically a whole scene. It was volleyball courts and chicks everywhere and a bunch of surfers and the waves were good that day. So this guy who's 10 years older than me he starts introducing me to his friends. Um, some of these guys were actually pro surfers and surfer you know, companies or whatever already had sponsorships and stuff. And they had a video camera going on that day on the beach on a big tripod. So I'm hanging out with these guys. I'm surfing myself. And then basically at some point I get asked if I wanted to run the camera for a while and video everybody. And he pointed out everybody who did a video and showed me how to use the camera real quick. So I was like, oh, yeah, let's do it. So I started messing with the camera and videoing all these guys. You know, I was like super young looking up to all these characters that are like 10 years older than me at the time. And I've already knew who some of these guys were from seeing them surfing at my local beach. So... 
that day we uh we rallied a bunch of people up and went back to this guy taco joe's house who was one of the guys that was surfing with us that day um they called him taco joe because he had a mexican restaurant right there near the beach called taco joe's so <laughs> he ran by that name for years miami mangoes actually knows him really well um, there's actually a video of uh, him and miami mango fighting in a boxing ring at a, at a nightclub years ago <laughs> so anyway we get back to that guy's house and I'm just a little young kid there. Everyone there is walking around with bongs and rolling up joints and fat, you know, fat bags of weed and rolling up joints with. And there's girls coming and going in bikinis. And there's a trampoline out back of the pool. And the guy's got a pack of pit bulls. And it's like a big fat Jeep. And I'm like, oh, shit, these guys are the shit. <laughs> so that day, I, uh, I met a couple other people that I'd never seen before I met. Um, and basically, I had already been buying weed at this point. So I started a conversation with one of the guys that was there that didn't surf. He was like one of the guys that didn't have any son. He was like pale and he had an English accent. So we started talking about something. I forget what it was about, but one thing led to another. And he gave me his information. If I ever wanted to get a couple ounces of weed here and there from him, he said, no worries. So, you know, he took me up. So that's basically the person that I met that day that would end up becoming my mentor later on. Um, that same day at that place, I met a few guys that were into, you know, being growers. I would find out later on, but I had no clue at the time, obviously. Wow. And, and was it a, a pretty rapid transition into being involved in their whole world or did it take some time to build some more rapport? No, it took a little time for sure. I think, like I said, I was 15 then, um, and just buying like an house here and there with some friends. So I got a car shortly after that and started hooking up with the guy and got buying maybe quarter pounds. He was fronting to me at the time. And like over time, a quarter pound will lead to a half pound and a half pound will lead to a pound. And it started to get a little stinky in my house and I was still living in my dad's house. So um, at that point in time, I think I was around 17, I want to say. Um, I was still living there and I had to go get a little warehouse, a little mini warehouse, uh, what do you call it, a mini storage unit. And I had to find one that had power in it that I could put a little refrigerator in and store the weed in. That was my whole goal. So I found one, did that. So I was able to buy a pound at a time and not have to worry about my dad finding it. So, um, yeah, that's basically how I started ramping up these guys, selling weed for them. Um, and at some point in time later on, I guess I was, yeah, middle 17 ish. I was asked by the English guy if I wanted to go on a trip to Amsterdam. And that's how that thing came up. Basically, he offered me, he offered me to pay for everything to go there with him. And if I would carry seeds back for him. And the reason he asked me that is because I had already gone on a couple of surf trips by then with some friends and we've gone to Costa Rica, uh, Puerto Rico, and a few other places by this point. And I always carry, we always carry weed on our pants back then because it was before 9 11 and it was easy to travel with weed. And it was basically like a no brainer. We did it like easily. So I guess my friend was super paranoid to do that himself. So he brought me along thinking like, oh, I'll bring them seeds back for him. No worries. So that was uh, the year I got asked to go to Amsterdam. But before I could even go there, I had to ask my dad for permission. And I couldn't tell him I was going to Amsterdam, obviously, because he probably would have said no in a heartbeat. Um, so I made up this whole story about how I was going to visit my friend's family in England. And we're going to go skateboard some some of the streets, maybe some, some uh, skateboard parks there and do some sightseeing and all this stuff. And my dad let me, like, I had no problem with it. So, and back then there was no passports needed to travel over there. It was just all you needed was a birth certificate. So um, it was pretty easy to do. Uh, so I think we went, I definitely, we went like uh, right before the holidays. So I had like some school time off, I want to say. Um, and it was like my last year in school there. And I was getting ready to move out of his house soon anyway. So it was pretty close to the end. Of me living there uh, so yeah that's when i went basically the first time so how, how old were you when you went over what year was it uh it was 1989 the very end of 1989 so i was 17 still um when i got back from that trip it you know turned 1990 and i think the end of that year by summertime i had moved out um so basically i when we got back from that trip i kind of had figured out that this guy was growing at this point along with a couple other people that came on the trip with us so I kind of had a feeling what was up. Um, I wasn't, I didn't see anything yet at this point, but I got home and started looking for a place to move out to. And I had this friend that I had surfing with all the time named Joe. Um, and he was actually a couple years older than me and was one of the ones that was actually buying some of the weed from me. And, it, you know, it grew from like, like I said, a 
quarter pound or half pound. Next thing you know, he's buying a couple pounds at a time. And we were slinging a good amount of weed together. So he had an apartment that had an extra bedroom and he, he offered me a place to move in. So I jumped on it and we started living together and going out partying together and selling weed together. He, he had connections that would come from central Florida, um, from like New Smyrna Beach and Orlando area. And that's actually how I met Craig because Craig would drive down with this guy, Mike Luke, um, together, like basically to buy as many pounds as they can get from us, cash. Um, so we had a pretty good thing going for a while until one day we came back home from, I don't know what it was, lunch or something together and the apartment had gotten broken into. So, uh, he made it look like basically I, I come to find out later on, it was the guy Joe that set it all up, but I'll get back to that eventually. Um, so the house looked like it was robbed. Both rooms got robbed. They found four pounds that I had in my room and they found some cash basically all I had. Um, they, he made it look like they stole stuff out of his room too. So I believe it was, you know, it was like we got randomly robbed by somebody. So we both moved out. I found my own place. Um, because of that robbery though, my friend that I, I had been buying the weed cash at that point because I was getting better prices for it. Um, and because of that robbery, my friend felt bad for me and basically offered me to come to his house one day, which I did and took me for a ride. And we went to his grow, which I had never seen before. Um, so that day I walked into this nice house in Boca Raton, like a thing is a four bedroom, three car garage, two or three car garage house. Um, and it was furnished super nice and set up like somebody lived there, but I could smell weed immediately when I walked in. So I knew what was up and he asked me if I wanted to be a helper um, on the next harvest trimming and manicuring and cleaning up the bash that was about to come out of this garage he showed me. So this was all like, whoa, you know, like hit me like. A ton of bricks. I was like, oh yeah, this is sick. So I jumped on the offer. He offered me, I think like two or three thousand dollars it was to like be there for three days straight, trimming with uh his then stepbrother and his stepbrother's best friend, who were like actually like a year younger than me. So yeah, that was around uh 18 years old, I guess, when I got offered that job and started doing that. And it was basically every two months, two or three months, I would go there for three days and make a couple grand and not only that, but I was also selling me for the guy and making money off that. Um, and that's how things started with me and him. Actually, I started learning, you know, little things about the house. And he started teaching me you know, about cloning and getting plants vegging and mom plants and cleaning up and all the important stuff that you need to know. Um, so, yeah, that was that all started around 18. Um, and then I think it was, uh, yeah, I turned 19. I had my own place at this point, and that same guy, Joe, um, was moved. he moved back up to Central Florida, where he was originally from, but he was still coming down and buying pounds and bringing cash. So uh, he came, we set up something one day where I had grabbed, I think, almost, yeah, it was 10 pounds, and I couldn't get to my warehouse in time that day where I would normally store it if I had to store it or whatever, because they closed the gates at 8 p.m., they opened up at 6 every day type thing, and I got there late, so I had to take it to my apartment. So the guy Joe gets there, he gets a hotel. Um, we go plan on going out that night. And he comes over to my house and I had the weed sitting in my refrigerator in a big seal meal bag and a garbage bag. And uh, he didn't know I was there, but he asked me for a beer at some point. I didn't think twice. And I told him to just grab one out of the fridge. I should have grabbed it myself thinking back, but he's seen the weed in there. And then we went out drinking. And on the way out, I stopped at a gas station to get gas. And he gets a page from his girlfriend at the time, blowing him up. And he had this crazy chick. Um, so he gets out of the car and goes to make a phone call saying, he's, you know, go talk to this chick about something and shut her up. So that basically he was off making arrangements to have somebody come to my place and rob it while we were out that night. So we go out drinking. He had some friends that owned some nightclub or he had a friend that was like a bouncer at a nightclub and another friend that like was a manager there or something. So we had connections at this nightclub we go to. So we come back like three, four in the morning, pretty late night, all drunk. And he comes to my house where he would normally would come in and at least come in and smoke a joint or do some bong hits with me before he would leave. But this night he decided to just drop me off and like tell me he'd meet me in the morning and we'll do the deal. So I didn't think anything of it. You know, it was pretty late. I go stumbling in the house and the first thing I noticed is my sliding house door was broken into. Um, so I ran straight to the fridge and seeing it was gone, the weed. 
uh, the house, they went through everything. They found my head stash. They found a few grand cash. I had a nice watch somewhere in the house. They took everything. I think they left me like a little grand nugget, like a joke. So <clears throat> because of that, uh, the same guy, the man guy from England, he felt bad again for me. And then that became um, my opportunity to partner up with him on that house, basically, because he was actually trying to get another house going somewhere north, like a couple hours north. He found 10 acres with a nice house on it. And he was starting to set it up, spent a lot of time there. And it was a perfect, perfect opportunity for him to have a partner at the time. And so I, he got me, uh, he got me to move out of that place, obviously. And I did, um, I realized pretty quickly that the guy Joe was a thief and it just didn't make sense. A lot of things that happened. And I called him out over on the phone and he, you know, basically admitted to it, kind of told me to fuck off and come to find out he was smoking Coke and doing free base and like really fucking up in life. So that's why he got to be that type of person. So I didn't know that side of the guy at all, but, you know, I just kind of was making money and he's kind of blind to it all. So <clears throat> it was actually that guy, I guess we could all thank for my situation and the OG Christian TK because of those robberies, uh, I was given the opportunity to run a group. And that's where that seed mistake actually happened. That grew up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you. Freebase Coke. <laughs> <laughs> no, let, let me just quickly jump in for a second there because there's so much interesting details there. The first thing I want to quickly ask you was that first time when you went over to Amsterdam, did you bring any genetics back? And as a follow up, was there any interesting weed you tried while over there? The first time I went, uh, we didn't find the. That good of weed, actually, the first trip. And the guys I was with were kind of arrogant, I guess you could call it. And we already had good weed in Florida, so we went there with high expectations. Um, so all the coffee shops we hit up the first day or two were just like uh, generic orange bud that seemed like it was the same stuff being passed around all the coffee shops, like it's tourist weed. And, I mean, we actually found some good hash that everyone was, like, stoked on. But uh, as far as actual flour, no. Um, actually, it took two days and that trip it was kind of a short trip. I think we went for like six or seven days that trip. Um, but like maybe day two or three, we were out drinking at a pub, playing pool, a couple of us. And we met this couple and we, we knew we were there for the seed bank. We didn't know where it was yet. Uh, we only knew about the seed bank because it was in the back of High Times magazine. They had these little articles back then all the time. And Sorry, just to confirm, you mean like Neville's The Seed Bank? The Seed Bank, yeah. This was 1989. Yeah, cool. Keep going. So this couple had some good weed on them, and they were actually rolling up cones and mixing tobacco in it. So we refused to do that, but we took a little nugget and rolled our own joint. It was really good. I, don't, I can't remember what it was, but it was that couple that basically gave us, um, told us how to get to the seed bank, which was at the Cannabis Castle at the time. And we thought we could actually walk to it, but we found out it was like an hour, hour and a half away by a taxi which we had no clue where that was. So I think the next day, some of the guys contacted um, the seed bank, made sure they were open before we tracked off. We got directions. And there was like four of us got in a van and, and went there that day and grabbed a bunch of stuff. And, you know, when I first came out, I might've said I met Neville back in the day or whatever, but I mean, I knew, we didn't know who Neville was back then, straight up. Nobody did. I mean, maybe some people that lived there or whatever did, but we only knew of the seed bank. And all the stories of Neville didn't come out until many years later. So we had all the packaging, we had the catalogs from there. And, you know, that's what I meant by we shopped at Neville's place, the seed bank, basically. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We could have met him, but I was so young. We, we went shopping there. We went in the castle. There was a, a little, it was kind of like a living room you walk into. It seemed like somebody lived there. And that's where they had their little shop. And I later find out they had like a basement where they were growing, but I never saw any of that. We've seen a big greenhouse out back. Um, but there was people working there. There's two or three, four people working there in the front at the, at the time. That's who we dealt with. Don't know who, who they were or names or Neville was one of them. Probably not. Cause so I know that right at the end of 89, apparently it was close to when he was almost getting in trouble or indicted. So who knows where he was at the time, but it was sure. definitely the bank. And it was definitely the, the cannabis castle that we shopped at. Um, and we grabbed a good majority of the stuff we could We grabbed like, um, there's, I think five growers that, out of the group and they were trying to get like a couple of packs of each for all of them. So we we're trying to get, I think like a dozen of each variety they had on the menu. Um, and a lot of it I didn't even see later on, like basically we got back to Florida and that stuff all got divided up amongst everybody. 
Um, and basically the Hindu Kush that I ended up popping with a real small pack for some reason, I don't know, maybe it was like they were low on inventory. I know it wasn't in the catalog and I know a lot of people claim that wasn't in the catalog and trying to prove whatever stories I was lying about because it wasn't in the catalog that then. But for whatever reason it was, um, he gave us a pack of Hindu seeds, Hindu Kush seeds, and they ended up being the ones that made the pollen in the Emerald Triangle room that you know created the triangle and OG Kush. With the sorry, I'll I'll just drill into some specifics because I know people will be interested. Do you, when you say a small pack, you mean like there was only like six seeds and not like ten or something? No, no, it was like a single pack. You know, like maybe ten or twelve seeds. It was I think by then. Uh, I want to say okay. And for some reason, they charged less for those than everything else. I think they were like two dollars a seed or some other stuff on the menu it was like five a seed. Um, we actually had a couple other fish uh, varieties on the menu. I remember that one was sold out. It was like fish times fish. And then another one we brought back was like skunk times fish. And for some reason, those were $2 a piece each, you know? So we didn't even think they were that good, to be honest. We thought they were based on the price that they're, you know, he was like giving away a freebie type thing. Ah, okay. And and the Hindu Kush seeds that you ended up popping, were they in like packaging that said Hindu Kush or was it just generic packaging or was it in like a pack that said something else but he was like, oh, by the way, this is actually Hindu Kush? Uh, I'm pretty sure they were all in actual seed bank packaging, but they're, we had to like consolidate them when we were out there to get yeah. back home in a like, little dime bags and then we hand wrote on everything. And I don't know who kept all the packaging on that trip. I know some of the packaging came back with us. And I know that some of the catalogs did too. Um, and I kept the catalog myself for, you know, it was like a porn magazine. I kept and looked at it all the time. <laughs> but uh, you know, as far as the packaging goes, I can't remember um, if it was, if they were all basically the C-Bank packaging that we took back and the Hindu Kush was one of them, or we just, you know, I just know that I, we had a pack of Hindu Kush that came from there that day and it was written on as Hindu Kush. Um, and did any of the other packs you got end up turning into anything memorable or was it really just that Hindu Kush that ended up being the memorable one for obvious reasons? No, we were we did a bunch actually. For There was definitely some prior to that. We were doing some Northern Lights 5 testing. Um, we found a really nice early pearl and a real nice uh, Northern Lights 5 haze um, that was actually a quick finisher, like 70 days or something. And they, you know, the guys I was with, they're all about the – the big yields and the fastest finish they can get uh, and bang it out, you know, that's and basically trying to squeeze five, six batches a year. So it was all about making the money, you know, I'm not going to lie. Mm. Um, if, if we had the opportunity back then and Florida was just that way, if we had the opportunity like in California or Washington or places, Hawaii or wherever, where you could actually get away with growing outdoor, I'm sure we would have been more into the, you know, that side of it, but it was all about crops, you know, making crop, making money out of the crops and, fast as possible I mean, these guys are all after the speed clones and stir you know genetics basically that would, were done in eight weeks nine weeks max and then beyond that they would pretty much give away or throw out um so we went through a bunch of nl5 haze and only kept one um and some of the guys actually that had a little more patience than the guy i worked with and would actually do some of their stuff a little longer so when it came down to me buying some of the weed i didn't always get just our stuff my friend was getting it from his little like co-op of friends that he had you know that to get from so if i needed five six pounds a week one week and we didn't have any he would get it from somebody else for me and some of those guys grew that haze way better than we did for whatever reason i'm sure they let it go longer like for us the guy would take it down in, like 60 days and it was still like a lot of white hairs and it's just kind of like real hairy orangey in the bag type look other times it would go a little bit longer or it seemed like it would swell up more maybe in the winter months or something but yeah, we ran that a couple of times. We ran a Northern Lights that was real short squat, big fat leaves, and it didn't yield that good. Um, we found a, a big skunk that was good. They found a Shiva skunk that was good from that. That was a huge yielder. I didn't like the weed actually, personally, but a lot of people liked it and, and they sold tons of it because it made, you know, like giant plants for whatever reason. I think, you know, like back then we were getting an average around two pounds of light and this this stuff for whatever reason was getting three pounds of light so it got all these guys all like psyched to grow that one um i didn't like it like i said <laughs> and then there was uh what else comes to mind some of the genetics these guys had when i came on board were actually some of the better stuff still that i remember growing back then it was like the emerald triangle the guy that we got the emerald triangle from came from washington state and he was probably 20 years older than me. So yeah, he was 10 years older than all my crew. 
But I think he might have been the guy that taught these guys the whole method of growing, the nutrients, and the whole setup, basically. Because he brought it from Washington, I want to say, like around 86 or so, 87. And that's when he took these genetics over here. Um, so he was the one that gave these guys uh, the Emerald Triangle. They had Williams Wonder. They had a clone of Big Bud. And I want to say the original G13 that we had came from him, although I can't confirm that. Um, but that one I've seen around Florida for years. Um, what else? There was a couple others he might have brought over. But, um, yeah, he was the one that basically started these guys, I think, on their path of, you know, like how they did their thing. Wow. That's that's so cool to hear. What a what an awesome range of genetics that was sort of going around. I want to quickly ask before we jump into the Emerald Triangle stuff because I know everyone's itching for it. You mentioned Williams Wonder. I'm a sucker for Williams Wonder. I love it. What was your memory of that special clone? Was it a good one? I loved it. It was a uh, it was the first time I've seen like real clumpy phallic stack. You know, like neon green, colorful weed like that. It was one of the first things I've seen growing actually. The first house I went to trim um, that I asked, I was asked to go trim was, I think it was a room of Williams Wonder and Big Bud and something else. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, that was the first time I ever seen like a full 12 light room going of anything. And I love smoking that stuff. It was always tasty. Interesting. That That's really cool to hear. And the gentleman who you describe as like possibly the one who introduced your friends to the whole growing scene, what was he like? Was he that typical old school, like, you know, kept his head down, didn't talk much about it? Or was he like willing to chat to you a bit about things? I never got to talk to him much. I met him a couple of times and my friends just like coming and going. And, and he, my friend would tell me, you know, stories about him and who he was. But he was to himself. He, I think he had like a 20 acre plant farm up in Palm Beach, I want to say. And one crazy story I do remember for sure about him was he had like a 30 or 40 light, like steel building going with uh, propane going for CO2. And I guess the guy had a big plant nursery and this was like in the center of his property and it was next to a big lake that he had. And I think something happened with a propane tank where it blew up the building, like midway through a batch. And the guy had like a bunch of excavators on the property and tractors and stuff. And I heard that he pushed the entire building that night into the lake <laughs> after it like burned down or I don't know, maybe it went out real quick or something, but it like the whole building imploded and he took his excavator and pushed it all in the lake and then buried that lake a few days later. And that was the last of it. <laughs> so that's, that guy was pretty, pretty heavy. Um, and back then, hearing about a 40 lighter or whatever it was that he had, it was just like, holy shit, that's crazy. Cause 12 lights was already as sketchy as can be. Wow. Yeah. I can only imagine back at that time, 40 lighter would have been insanity. So let's just quickly jump back to it then. So you, you've got back from Amsterdam, you've got these new genetics. How did things progress from that point to when you eventually began involved in the house where, uh, you know, you started popping some of those seeds such as the Hindu Kush? Um, well, Basically, once I got robbed by that guy and moved out, I got myself a place maybe a mile away from that other grow house my friend had. He actually owned the house. And uh, once he let me start taking over and sharing a batch with him and started doing this thing up north, I would start riding my bike there or drive. We had a car park there every night, like a decoy car. But I, I was able to ride my bike there, even walk there if I wanted to. So I started going there daily, um, taking care of the place. He would still come down like once a week, maybe twice a week sometimes, make sure everything was cool and check in on me, um, check in on everything that was going on. Um, so yeah, I was at that house that we would start popping those seeds. And at this point, I was like, you know, I was starting to get really into it. And I was super intrigued to find new flavors all the time. So I was probably more into it than these guys were as far as finding that new genetic. And they normally would, we had like a little space. I'll, I'll explain how the room was set up eventually, but we had a little space by our doorway where we had like a little space for four plants, five plants maybe. And that's where we would do our testing at. So we didn't even have like a dedicated area. It was just kind of like a little extra space. Um, we had a little closet somewhere where we would sex plants to see if they're male or female. But then once they were, they were sex, we would put them in there and test them. And if they didn't turn out like phenomenal, they would usually get canned like on the first batch or given away to somebody if they were good. Um, so there's only like a handful that we really kept and like lots of stuff that I really, we went through that I wish we kept. Like there was one called Hawaiian snow that to me was like the first time I ever seen a bag, like squeeze the bag and it would just leave like a super shiny, shiny coat on the bag. And it was like real neon green, some sort of sativa cross. I can't remember what it was, but 
they killed it immediately. Of course, you know, I had like head stash of it for a while and um, got to enjoy maybe a half pound of it or something, but that was when they killed it off. I wish they kept, there was a handful and a bunch of them. I think there was like a Northern lights time skunk. There was a, you know, a handful of good ones that just never made the cut because like I said, these guys were sticking to those big yielders and, you know, they seem to be happy with what they already had seemed like for the most part. That's interesting to hear. Yeah, I can imagine that like stuff would have been quick to be culled back in those days. So, what was who was it who decided to pop the seeds? Did you, did you have a feeling about these Hindu Kush seeds, or how did that all go down? Um, I don't exactly remember why. I think they were just maybe next in line or something. I know for a fact that like the one before that, like when I first came out, I wasn't one hundred percent sure it was a Hindu. I told a couple people that it was either Hindu or Northern Lights or a couple of different things that I wasn't 100% sure on. But then once me and my friend Craig started talking about it all, because he he was super into all these different genetics like me, he would come down and I had this little tackle box with like these little dividers and it kept like a real sealed um, lid. And I kept all these different flavors in there for, I don't know why, but it was just something at the time. And he came down and we would basically go through these like little, little, little like mini cannabis cup and sample them all out and bong hits and joints and so for sure he talked about the the seeded hindu kush and the hindu kush that that we grew it was like there was like probably five plants there was like two real short mutant ones that I had to like prop up off the ground because they weren't getting any light and there's two that were like kind of reaching up to the trellis so there was definitely not a consistent uh, as far as the growth structure there's like i said there's almost like two indicas and two almost like hybrid kind of leaning and stretchy plants um, but whatever it was, they all tasted just super different and incredible. Like I was so bummed that my friend killed them all off after he did, because I would take them all home for some head stash grown or something if I, you know, if I had to. But he basically killed them all off because he didn't want to take a chance of any more seeds coming out anywhere. We we never found the Hermie plant. We basically just cut everything, dried it, and that's we found out the seeds were in there afterwards. So I ended up taking, I think, those plants to smoke, basically, and uh, we killed off. He killed off all the bombs that we kept from seed, and that was the last of the hindu, basically. But it was definitely different. And Craig and I, we had seeds of it for a while. Um, that was probably, you know, crossed with itself or whatever. And uh, I had a seeds collection in this hollow coke can. This is years later, this happened, but uh, that coke can had all these seeds from that batch and other batches the animal triangle batches that were seeded here and there just the collection i have from amsterdam still from 93 when i went back and this girl uh, i was dating at the time i went to like a, on a surf trip and she was trying to like, clean my house and like do me a favor and like surprise me and i come home and the coke can was in the refrigerator and i guess she threw it out but she'll deny it to this day because she never admitted to it um, but she was probably cleaning the house and tried to pop the can and it wouldn't open and she probably just, it looked like an old can and she just tossed it <laughs> but that that can has so many good seasons it's ridiculous so uh died out of those things back that that sounds so there's like a lot of critical information in there i'd love to get a few specifics so um you know for anyone who's not familiar like the the idea is that you know the tk um, and OG Kush came from an accidental pollination involving this unknown clone called the Emerald Triangle and the Hindu Kush that we're speaking about. So, so just to confirm, there was no males in the room. It was it was a, a Hermy pollen donor. Never saw a male. We never had seeds before in the, in the uh, Emerald Triangle. And there was definitely no light leaks because that was something that I was always warned to never open the doors. And so there's you know there was no flashing lights in the room or anything. We never found. We never found a culprit, so it had to be. We just assumed it had to be from one of those plants that went hermy. And I mean, sure. I never even knew what a hermy was at that point. I was pretty young; it was my first year really growing weed on that kind of scale, and I had never really seen a hermy before that, so didn't really know what to look for. Didn't know that some small plant like that can make so much pollen it would pollinate in most of a room. But the way the room was set up, we had an AC. Um, added to the room like a five ton AC unit, and it was like four feet away from the door. So, in the way I guess the we had the fan set up so it circulated the room, um, like like cyclonic, and apparently it just sucked all that pollen right directly into the AC vent and then spread across through the vents across the whole room. So, that was you know something we never really thought about when we were testing seeds there, obviously. At that point, we obviously thought, you know, I only thought males could do that. And so once we realized we had no males, we thought we were good to go. <laughs> so, yeah. So based on what you're saying, there was like quite a fair bit of seed produced in the overall crop. 
Well, I was pretty consistently seated, but some people said they found a shitload in there. Other people said they couldn't find but maybe one. So it wasn't like really, really spread across the room. There's Craig, you can remember, had on a batch that was like, said he'd open up a bud and every single little nugget had a seed in it. So maybe that was closer to the vent or to the, to the pollination or something. But yeah, it wasn't really, really bad. Like like Alec Anderson, for example, the one who found the OG Kush seed, he swears that there wasn't many seeds at all. Yeah, like I think he bought four ounces off Craig back then. That came from me. And uh, out of out of those four ounces, I think he said he found one or two seeds, I want to say. So he'll sit there and argue that it was not many seeds at all, but that was definitely from the same batch of weed. Yeah, wow. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to have to keep pulling us back because there's so many interesting yeah. details here. So, um, so when you talk about the Hindu having those two different sort of phenotypes, generally speaking, the squatter ones, you had to prop up and the lankier ones, those lankier ones, did they sort of have a structure that resembled the OG and the TK to you? That I can't remember. I just know that they were really small plants when I put them in there. There was kind of like last minute kind of thing. I tossed them in. Um, and they just kind of grew like single stock bean pole and grew like little nuggets across the whole branch. Um, no side arms really, because they never really had a chance to veg out much. Um, so that's why I was really bummed to get to run them a second time. Sure. And and in terms of the uh, the smoke, you know, you said it was good smoke. Were there any of those four plants, four or five plants of the Hindu um, when you smoked them? Was there anything about them that reminded you of the OG or the TK, or do you think maybe the end product is more reflective of the Emerald Triangle? Um, it's hard to say. It was uh, the Emerald Triangle has kind of like a much thicker structure, and we we would top those, and the way we grew it was off the ground. Um, I'll, I'll get into that real quick. The way the room was set up. So this this. I think it was brought from Washington also, this blueprint of how we did everything with stolen power and a five ton AC with 12 lights, that particular nutrient brand and everything. So we would get into a garage, you know, these guys did anyway. I, I, I helped a couple later on, but they would go into a clear garage, um, clean it out and then run a hose across the floor and find where the water would puddle the most. And then that's where they would drill like a half inch hole out would go through the slab of the house to the ground. And it would do like 12 or so holes in the room. So basically, once you set up the room, the plants would grow on the ground and it would do drip to waste and the, the water would find its way to those holes. And that's basically how all these rooms are set up. So off the ground, um, basically, well, first off, they would set up three um, garbage cans where like the stations or the, like a big pickle barrel or where they would feed from. And each one controlled 100 plants on the ground. And there was a divider wall where the, the barrels were and like the hose and everything was usually where the garage door was. We would build like a little divider wall. And then beyond that was where the grow room was. So those three um, barrels would control 300 plants that would sit on the ground in rows in one gallon pots in clay pebbles. And we used to use these little skinny like black drippers, um, like a little spaghetti dripper they called about then. And we used to use common Home Depot timers, like hardware store timers and run them at like every two hours for like one or two minutes, I want to say. So that's basically was the dripping, the water, the watering system, the lighting. We used to have these round, um, Chinese hat style hoods and you put them together and they end up being like four feet around and they had vertical lighting back then in those. So we had checkerboard highlights, sodium, um, in those lights and they're super lightweight and you can control them from a single string. So what we would do is at the doorway of the garage, um, we'd have these like dock cleats where you could tie off to and, and each light had its own little pulley attached to the ceiling. And so once we built the trellis in the room, um, you could control all the lights like height and lowering and whatever from the doorway. And basically that's, how the lights were set up. We had like two dehumidifiers up high on the wall where the water just ran to the floor. And um, we had a five ton AC and all of this needed extra power. So back then, obviously everyone was stealing power. Like it was no big deal, which was sketchy in itself because everybody knew that if you got caught just doing that, you're facing some sort of federal felony by the power company and um, they could you know sue you and all this stuff. So that, that part alone was sketchy. But uh, you couldn't do 12 lights in Florida that then without stolen power unless you had like a mansion. <laughs> wow, that's that's really interesting. I mean, 
gosh, a lot. I, I'm sure it's well thought out. Wh- when you had those holes on the ground and the plants were on the ground, did it not get like really cold? Uh, I'm sure it did, but you know it was Florida, um, so we like I said, it was that was South Florida, and it was hotter down there than than other places I've grown. But um, I don't seem to remember any issues. All the batches have turned out pretty good in there, and like the weed was always fire. Um, as far as temperature goes, and, and I could see if you're up like in northern, like in the New York or up north, that would probably be too cold on the ground. You'd almost have to add heating or something to the to the floor if you did it that way. But in Florida, <laughs> we didn't have that problem. Um, and, and going back to that room, uh, we didn't quite finish the trellis. Basically, we would put these first strips of wood around the entire room in two different levels, and go around and attach little eye hooklets every like foot or so. And then it would take two people. We'd go in the room while the plants were small and have a roll of twine. We would toss back and forth with each other and like loop through the eye hookless and make like a weave trellis basically. And we'd work our way in the two weave all the way out to the door. Uh, it took a while, but once we got to the door, that was like the last time you could get in the room basically. So once you got it all trellis off. So I mentioned that before in the past about the homemade trellis we used to do because you couldn't buy trellis back then. Um, so basically this whole 12 light room was completely trellised off with two layers of nets, you know, and then they didn't come down until harvest, basically. That's a cool setup. Gosh, you got me thinking I could probably integrate some of these practices into my grow. <laughs> <laughs> as far as the beds back then, what we did was uh, we would take clones into one-inch cubes. It was Ruckles already around in the 80s. Um, so we would put them in one-inch cubes. They would take like 400 at a time to get 300 good ones. And then they would go into three-inch cubes with holes in them. And then from there, we didn't have uh, grow tables back then, so we built our own. Um, so the mom room was built on these big wooden grow tables that had shower liner um, on top of it, like glued together to keep the water from leaking. And uh, they had like two or three thousand watt lights in that room with big moms on in containers getting drip drippers with the rocks. Then the small bedroom where the uh, babies would go into was like a like a bit probably like an eight by four by eight table they built with wood plywood with sides and they also used the shower liner on that too and they would be on a tilt and they would put all the, the three inch cubes on there um, with a thousand watt over those and to water them they would just you know dump water down one side of the table and it would run down through all the plants to the other side to a drain with that so we would get them like about a foot tall in there pretty much before they would go into the main room and that's when they would go into the one gallon pots with the rocks and the drippers and they would get a pretty good size in those three inch cubes i mean they'd be fully white roots you know busting out of the bottom of them at, you know by the time you put them in the rocks um so and then we would start off with the lights all the way up at the ceiling we put first put them in there because back then there was no dimming or whatever so we were using thousand watt lights so we kept them all the way to the ceiling and the light would uh, work the way down on the first week you know we'd slowly bring them down off the pulleys nice nice and i'd love to ask you before i forget tell me a bit about um the emerald triangle strain itself you know i think a lot of people would be really interested in that one do you did you see like how would you describe it was it a kush type plant was it a more lanky plant what's your recollection uh well the first time i i used to buy it before i seen it growing for a couple years so i know it was around before i ever seen the grow um, these guys were growing it probably I think from like 86, 87 or whatever when that guy brought the genetics to Florida. Um, so that one off the floor, off the one gallon pots, top of the pot would grow to be about four foot tall on average, maybe a little bit taller. Um, we topped it and it would grow four or five heads, but there were thicker stems and definitely way bigger leaves than any of the triangle oil or OGs that I've seen. Actually, I've seen a couple of big leaves on some of the OGs, but this, these seem to get pretty big. And as far as smell, I seem to remember it, it definitely had more of a floral, sweet scent to it. It was definitely super good. It had like more of a candy kind of leaning turf, I want to say. Um, and knowing where it came from, you know, and, and all the stories since then, there's a good chance it has some northern lights in it. Because, I mean, that's the northwest up there in Washington. we got to give them props because, first off, that's where most of the northern lights came from. Um, you know, I've, I've heard multiple stories now. Basically, that's where they originated from, originated from. And even Neville supposedly got a lot of his seeds from there that he took back to Amsterdam and started breeding with. Also, um, from the Northwest was uh, Emerald Triangle um, from Washington. 
And then there's years prior, there's this kryptonite strand here in Florida that was the rumors uh, that the clone came from Seattle area as well, from like a scientist that worked at a college there or something. Um, that was more of an 80s genetic. But uh, yeah, there's definitely been a lot of stuff come from that zone. Um, between there and Santa Cruz and Nermo Triangle of California, that whole Pacific Northwest out there, you definitely got to give him credit for a lot of the stuff. A lot of it went full circle to Amsterdam, to Florida, and back, and whatever. Um, but the perfect salad came together in the house that we were growing. <laughs> yeah, no, huge credit to the Pacific Northwest. They've they've done a lot. Some of my favorite strains, like the Blue Magoo, come from that area. So huge, huge work done there by those guys. I guess I'd be interested in terms of the Emerald Triangle itself. If you had to pick, do you feel like the OG and the TK lean more towards the Emerald Triangle, maybe the Hindu, or like some sort of unique combo of the two that's not necessarily like one or the other? Uh, it's definitely a mix because the Emerald definitely wasn't making like popcorn nuggets, I don't remember. It was more like spears, like bigger spear buds. And like I said, it definitely was a bigger yielder. And definitely bigger stems. I remember we used, used to have to use like um, yard loppers to cut them down because they get so fat, you know, versus like the TK and the OG, you can cut them down almost with scissors at times. Um, so there's that. It definitely made bigger leaves because it was actually some of the bigger leaves I remember seeing at the time growing at all the stuff we were growing at, at that particular moment or era. Um, but like, yeah, I really can't say as far as like the gassy notes, I can't, I, I don't remember it having too much gas to it. Now the, the Hindu, um, I can't remember, I can't pinpoint if those are gassy or not either, but they're extremely different than anything we had or smoked before. Um, so, you know, the, the fact that I, I kind of point towards those is because like years later in the last few years, there's a lot of information came out from like Neville himself and other people, um, that have claimed that his Hindu Kush work was basically NL2 cross with uh, Kush 4. I've heard a couple other different stories too, but they always included Northern Lights type genetics. So there's that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard some of those comments as well. So, you know, I think that's reasonable. I'd be interested to know. So when you did this crop, was it basically like a room full of Emerald Triangle plus these Hindu plants or is... Were there other plants in the room? Like, were you doing a mix sort of thing, or how was the setup? We try to do one main genetic at a time for whatever reason. I think just based on how big our moms were that we had, and we only had limited space. And uh, this group of guys would pass genetics around the tribe between us, and we would grow out two or three big moms of them, and then that would be the one that we would take clones off of, for example. So for whatever reason, that room I did was all Emerald Triangle. It was like 300 Emerald Triangle plants. And then those five or six uh, Hindus. Ah, uh, interesting. Okay, so when you got to the end of the harvest and you're seeing there's these seeds in the bud, were, were there enough seeds that you thought, oh, this is going to affect the ticket, or was it like you know you couldn't really tell unless you cracked it open? And did you pop any of those seeds? Um, it definitely affected the ticket, and the owner of the house, my partner, he was definitely pissed off at first. Um, because in his mind, we were taking away tons of weight from the plants, focusing on the energy towards making seeds. So he always had this set thing in his mind where he had to get at least, you know, like 24 pounds per room, two pounds per light, or he was pissed off type thing. And I think that room ended up being maybe like 20 pounds or whatever, I want to say. Um, so, yeah, he was pissed. But at the same time, I sold it all immediately to my buddy Craig up in Orlando and to my buddy Mike Luke uh, up in that same area, too. And uh so luckily, that's who got those because it was Craig's friends that would end up finding the TK and the OGC later on. Yeah, okay. I mean, I want to hear about that, but I want to quickly ask, did you pop any of those seeds immediately or did you sort of just put it on the back burner? And then, yeah, tell us a bit about how the weed went from there and where the seeds ended up going. I personally didn't grow, pop a lot of those seeds. A lot of those seeds ended up going into that cocaine like I talked about. I collected thousands of them and I had like this huge Ziploc baggie of them. Um, I never had a chance to pop many of them because like I said, they got tossed out a couple years later. Um, I had a few friends that tried popping some here and there. I don't remember anything that came out like super keeper style. We've, you know, I've seen some stuff that had similar structure maybe to the OG and TK, like round popcorn, like acorn shaped, like clumpy nuggets, you know, growing up the main shaft and 
had that same pushy look to it, but definitely wasn't like super dank, like some of the stuff we already had at the time. Also, there was, uh, well, there was another strain, I'll, I'll get into that story as well, but there was another strain that came into our group called the hash plant and went by. Um, so basically this was like a couple years later, it's like 93, 94. Um, so a friend of mine one day they called me up and he's telling me he has this plant at his house that his bitchy girlfriend wanted out of there immediately. So he like, asked me to come over and get it if I would. Um, I guess he knew I grew at the time. It's kind of the reason why he asked. So I went over there to his place and it was this little ceiling that was probably like six inches tall and like a solo cup. So I took it and he swore that it came from some of the best weed he's ever seen in his life. Some of the stinkiest shit ever. And I had to try it. I had to make sure I didn't kill it, whatever. So I took good care of it for a minute. <laughs> I took it to my friend's house that grow at, at this point in time i had moved on i was doing my own thing and and like we would stop doing the partnership thing together but i was still helping him do the trimming and helping him sell the weed so i took this plant over there um to his place and i set it off the side of, in the mom room and i came back a couple of days later and it was gone and i asked him like where it went and he said he tossed it in the trash because it had this like mutated looking leaf and he usually thought that those kind of seedlings were shit, so he didn't want it anymore so he just threw in the trash on me. So I go to the trash, which had like the lid was half open still, and it was like light getting in there. And I pull it out, it's still alive. I was like trying to grow through some debris in the trash can. I take it home with me, and it did have a weird leaf, but I nursed it back to health to where it started growing normal leaves again. Uh, so at this place, in point in time, I had two lights at this house I lived in, and it was just more for like hobby and personal stash and help facing bills. And once that plant got big enough to take enough clones to fill the two lights up with, I flowered it out by itself and it ended up being some super stinky, like really, really good weed, just like the guy said. Um, but it made its own seeds for whatever reason. There was no other plants there that did it. There was no light leaks, nothing. Um, it made, you know, probably 10, 20 seeds per plant or whatever it was, small amount. And, uh, those seeds would go on to be some of the stinkiest, best weed I have ever seen to this day. And I would literally almost like trade my truck right now in a heartbeat for any one of those <laughs> that we had. That's how good they were. Um, I know we're jumping around all over the place, time time frame, whatever, but <laughs> just going talking about the weed here. Um, so anyway, that, that particular variety, we never ran in the big room because we knew it made seeds, but I kept it around anyways for a personal. And those seeds from that, for whatever reason, I decided to start popping um, once I bought my own house, like a year later, 2000 or no, 1994, uh, bought my own house up in Jupiter. And we started going through those seeds and it took a long time to realize it. And we named a bunch of them with numbers. It was like HP four and nine and a bunch of different numbers and passed them around. And like some of the best stuff I like, like ever, the number four was this like skinny leaf, jagged, sharp edge with like leaves, almost like razor sharp. I'm like a soft tooth or something. Um, and I've never seen a plant like that before. And that was the best one of them all. And it happened to be the one that got some sort of virus like within a year or two and died off, unfortunately. Um, that was my favorite. Um, There's three or four others that went on to be like extremely stinky and good that like people would grow it and almost have, almost have like run into the law immediately because it was just so strong. So come to find out years later, I ran into the guy that the original seed came from and he we were at a strip club one night and we we're drinking and having a conversation about this stuff I told him a story about that seedling he laughed he's like you know what that was from a super skunk crossed with a hash plant that made its own seeds for some reason it, the room made a few seeds and like that's where your buddy found that seed from <laughs> so yeah it was actually super skunk crossed with hash plant i don't know where the seed came from he didn't know where it came from but everything that that the seeds, you know, almost everything we popped out of those seeds were like keeper style. There was probably a handful that weren't, but like the majority of the ones we kept were just some of the all time, my all time favorites. Um, and there might be one still around this day that somebody made seeds with it. I'm trying to track down and uh, we just had a hard time finding it still so far. Yeah. Shout out. Get in touch with Marty if you know anything. That sounds cool, man. So, I, I mean, I'd love to know what was the path from, you know, the point of your first sale to, I believe you said, Craig and another guy. How did that then transition into having TK, the OG, to the best of your knowledge? Well, uh, 
that see the batch and animal triangle that happened in 1991. That was the year I was living on that house. Um, and at that point, Craig was coming down and getting stuff from me directly. And, or I would bring up stuff to him sometimes. Maybe give him out a uh, five or 10 pack on the front. If he didn't have the cash for it. And we had a working relationship like that. Um, so at some point in time, he got a hold of like 10 of the seated pounds, took them back up there. And his dad uh, at the time was helping him sell the weed. His dad had a karate studio and a surf shop and had a lot of clientele and surfer friends that smoked. So they had a lot of people they sold to. Um, so they sold, you know, three, four pounds every couple of days, basically piecing them out. So they would go through a 10 pack in a week or two weeks pretty fast at that end. Um, so it was out of that batch that Craig um, had sold to his good friend, who I had met a couple of times over the years. And he's the guy that found the TK. Another guy was Alec Anderson, which I never met him back in the day, but or never heard of him really until recently. But um, he also had bought a quarter pound. The other guy bought like a pound or a couple of pounds of it and found a bunch of seeds. The guy Alec Anderson only found one or two seeds from like four ounces. Um, so the other guy was one that found the TK. Um, he's the one that first told us many, many years ago, like mid nineties that like, he got a hold of Craig and he's like, Hey, I found this killer seed in that batch of ammo triangle that you guys had years ago, a couple years ago and popped a couple of seeds of it. And I found this super keeper you guys should check out. And that was around the time that he had brought Craig a fresh plant of it. That was like, just cut down, shoved into a brown bag like took a couple of these off it, but there's like stem and everything was in there. And I drove up from Jupiter where I was living at the time. It was like an hour drive and went to Craig's house and basically thinking I was going to get some weed to smoke. And it was this wet plant and we got, we had to split up and like dry it out ourselves and smoke it. So his whole theory was, we'll give you a quarter pound. We'll dry it to an ounce. And uh, me and him, me and Craig shared it and split it and it ended up just getting fire regardless. It, I was smoking on it when it was still wet, like little little hits of it in the bong and it was just so tasty. Um, and we knew right away we had to have it, but he told us right away that it was, it was super skinny growing. It didn't make much and I don't expect much of a yield from it type thing. So that's, we went into it looking at it like that. Um, so shortly after that happened, he had brought Craig some clones of it and I drove up to grab some. Um, and I met the guy at Craig's house a couple times. He stood out to me then because he was, he was a tattoo artist and he actually worked in Orlando at then Cornbread, Cornbread Ricky's uh, tattoo parlor out there in Orlando, um, which I never met those guys until years later. But I met this guy that found a TK seed and he was a tattoo artist. And basically, that's I met him at Craig's house multiple times and stood out to me. So later, when all this stuff came out five years ago, um, Craig and I started talking. And at first, Craig had already totally forgot that it was that guy. And he was, for some reason, thinking it was Alec Anderson that gave us our cut, which I had never even met Alec. So I had to like refresh his memory. And immediately, he you know he thought back and I felt like an idiot because I think he went public a couple of times and told people it came from Alec, the triangle, but it wasn't. Um, so yeah, he fixes he fixed all that in his, in his memory bank, and we've we've laughed about it since then, and we've gone over all this stuff. But um, it was definitely this other guy who doesn't want really want his name to be told anymore, and I guess you know for whatever reasons he's just kind of to himself and quiet. So um, yeah, that's how that went. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So so you actually had the the TK quite early, or how how long would it have been after it was found? Did you get it then? It was a couple of years. I think he's, I want to say they found it right afterwards, probably around 92, 93, 92 ish or something. Um, I don't think I got it till I moved into my house in Jupiter in 94. I don't think I got it till like the year after that. So 95, 96, I think is when I got it. Yeah, me and Craig both. Interesting. Okay. And then when did you hear about the, this, you know, the OG Kush found by Alec? That was many years later. That was uh, that wasn't until I created my first Instagram account and kind of went public. Um, and at that point, I only knew about the triangle being related to me. Um, and then my buddy Miami Mango made a comment on his post on Instagram. At this point, I was living in Central America, kind of like laying low. had a, I had an art page because I was selling art, and that was the only thing I had on Instagram. But then one day, I started getting all these random like cannabis accounts following me <clears throat> for whatever reason. I had like a hundred new followers that day and I didn't know why. 
then he goes by Miami Mango. Everyone knows him as. I'm sure you know him as that too. Um, I grew up with him in South Florida, like going way back to like 11th grade. I've known him that long and we used to sell weed to each other occasionally here and there. And uh, he kind of ousted me on one of his posts talking about Triangle Kush and mentioned my art page on his weed page. And that's where all those followers came from. So that's kind of how I came out. And at first I was a little bit mad about it. You know, I was kind of eggy. Um, didn't really want to be part of the scene yet. Didn't really care for it. We were happy living, laying low in Central America. And uh, he taught me into creating an account on Instagram and like, you know, joining in with him or whatever and causing a ruckus. So that, that was when I created Origins DK. And that was the first name I came up with when I created the account, basically. Um, so it was after that, that I started meeting people through through him. For example, he introduced me to Josh D. And he told me about this strain that Josh D had called the OG Kush that he thought was very similar to the Triangle Kush and that I should maybe meet him and see if we could figure that out. So at that point in time, shortly after I created Origins, Josh and I started talking. He invited me and my fiance to California to go visit his farm in uh, Santa Barbara. So shortly after that, we did that. And that's when I met Josh and we started trading stories and um, that's about the time I started seeing or hearing podcasts with Alec Anderson and talking about Bubba bringing the cutout from him out to Florida, from Florida to California to Josh. And, you know, I did all the research and talking to Josh back and forth. That's where I learned more and more about all that. Um, and it wasn't until even a couple of years after all that, before we put more pieces together, where like Alec Anderson finally admitted that the seed came from us because at first he was making up different stories saying that it was, uh, there was a plant that died and somebody that died that had the plant. So he kind of like dead ended the story there, you know, and then years later it came out on another Adam Dunn show that my mango and my buddy Craig actually called in on and they started talking to Alec in person. It was the creepy episode. And on that episode, Alec was like, Oh man, I didn't want to say any names or whatever. And I was being respectful towards, you know, the surfer code. And basically he admitted that that seed came from our weed um my weed from craig basically back in the day wow him coming out and, and admitting all that just kind of like put it all the, you know that piece of the puzzle together i already known from from josh's side of the story about how um he got the cut from matt bubba burger who somehow got it from i think there was a story i, I haven't talked too much to alec but there's a story i'm on the podcast he talked about where one of his old roommates that like robbed them at gunpoint for some of their genetics or something uh, and then it was like a mutual friend of him and Bubba that had gotten a hold of those genetics or something like that. And so Bubba had taken them from there. Um, I guess, I guess he was already living in California and he was teamed up with Josh somehow in Hollywood in a grow. And they're growing a few different things out there. But Bubba was like, Hey, I got these genetics in Florida. I can go grab that would just blow the stuff away. And he was talking about a fish plant that he had out here. So he came out to Florida and he grabbed a few cuts of it along with a couple other things they had here and brought them back out to their grow. And that's how Josh got a hold of it. And that's where the story started in LA. Like at that point it was only called Kush. And according to Kenji and be real and Josh and some of the other people involved, once it made its way out there, it became like super popular because it was really, really good. And basically it started fetching crazy prices, like talking like, $800 an ounce of some, some, uh, predicaments. So because of that, people started naming everything Kush, seeing if they can get higher prices for their stuff, according to Josh and these guys. Um, and so because of that, they had to change the name and that's when the OG thing started. Um, OG being for original and that was Josh and Bubba and Kenji and a couple other, their friends and be real is doing basically. And like, how does it feel to see like the way these two strains have gone on to like become like top tier lists of every smoker out there? Oh, it's super cool, super humbling for sure. I get a lot of people that are super appreciative of it all. I get a lot of thank yous all the time, and um, just really warm welcoming for the most part. You know, there's been a couple of characters that I've had some run into with here and there, but for the most part, everyone's been really cool. Josh and his old pack that I met, we've become like really close friends since then. Um, he was actually just visiting my place in Central America uh, last week. Um, and he, he had a place down there as well himself for years. 
for some just random reason, he doesn't even surf, but he has this little house on the beach that me and Craig used to go to as kids, like on our first couple of surf trips and surf this little random beach, um, far from everything. And we used to go there to get away from the crowds. And Josh just so happens to have a house there. <laughs> so this is a weird coincidence. We have a lot in common. Um, so he was down there with his family and for his wife's birthday and they visited all my, my little area and basically got to check out some restaurants I set him up with and some hotels and stuff. So that was cool. Yeah. Shout out Josh D. Whenever I've um, met him at like events, he's been super nice guy. Always enjoyed hanging out with him. So definitely, definitely on board with that. And I guess I wanted to quickly ask while we're on the topic, because I do want to get back to the story. Um you know, there's a myriad of OG Kushes that have all come out since the originals, you know, like I guess some of the more famous ones like, you know, like the Fire OG, the Face Off OG, SFV. Do you have any favorites or have you tried most of these ones? And what's your thoughts? Do you think like to a degree some of them are S1s of others or like where do you see that? When I first met Josh, um, him and... A guy named Mojave that were at the farm the first day we met. Mojave was actually partners with Adam Dunn in Amsterdam in their seed company years ago. So he's a, he's like a wealth of knowledge. He's I learned a lot from him about history, and he was actually part of the uh, the big Holy Sir um, strain. I want to say his family was. So he knew a lot um, that day at the farm. Uh, basically, they were growing all OGs. So that was the first time I ever got to see. OG, um, Josh OG, Ghost OG, uh, Ryan OG, Marathon OG. He had the TK going. He had like a whole two acres of like all the OGs going. So I was like a kid in a candy store that day. Um, so we were walking around checking them all out. And like basically he had batches that were like three, four weeks old. And then he had some there like maybe two, three weeks from being done or something, maybe a little longer. So I got to see a couple of different, different phases of them as well. But to me, at first, like our, our thing at first was we were trying to figure out if the triangle and the OG were basically the same plant that maybe had mutated over the years. This is prior to the whole Alec thing coming out. And, you know, this is five years ago when I first met Josh and we had first started talking. So before I met or talked to Alec, um, and you know, there were still a lot of like discrepancies about which cut was which, and a lot of people seem to think they're the same thing. But in person, you can see there's definitely height differences. And I mean, it's not very similar to the to the finger rub, but like once they got a little closer to being done, you can see they're definitely different. Uh, you can see all the different variations. According to Josh and Mojave that day, they claimed that the majority of them, the good ones, all came from the same cut and were just renamed over the years. And that they grew in different locations and they might have morphed a little bit and to be a little bit different than the original. So that was our first train of thought um and since then we kind of realized that for sure the tk and the og are from different seeds so they're like sisters um and they definitely if you grow them side by side they definitely have a lot of differences to them so yeah we figured that much out since then um i haven't grown a whole lot of them i've grown a handful i've smoked a lot of them uh unfortunately i haven't had a large area facility to like collect and store a bunch of genetics since all this stuff started for me like when I first came out of hiding and was on Instagram, I was living in Central America. We had a small place and then, you know, I had like a couple of little tiny rooms. I was able to do stuff in down there, but taking big risks down there, if you get in trouble, obviously. Um, and we actually had a home invasion down there too, which I'll get it, get to eventually. Um, so yeah, those, uh, I didn't haven't really had a chance to, to pr- properly grow out all the OGs myself, like Josh has. Um, like I was more familiar obviously with the triangle, but they grow very similar to each other. Um, very similar structure, very similar like traits and leaf look and stems and everything. They both are a little bit, they like less light than most plants. Um, so yeah, those are things that uh, I've come to learn the last few years, but about the OGs and stuff, you know, are definitely very similar as far as the TPA goes. Um, as far as growing most of them, I would love to. I'm, I'm looking forward to the day where Florida eases up on home grow and I could have all the OGs in my collection here and get to try them all myself. But as far as favorites go, that other than the original OG and the TK, I've had a really good bag of face off. That was insane. Um, I've also had some crosses that were made with that in Costa Rica from C that I like a lot. A couple other ones I had down there from like archive that were crosses with his, uh, 
this face off recent more recently we had a z face we went through here a bunch of um, genetics or a bunch of seeds of it and found some real nice gassy couple of skittles type ones um so definitely have to like the face off i definitely the first time i actually seen um any of the ogs on that trip i ran into josh was actually a san fernando valley that my friend had in santa cruz um that actually reminded me of the triangle when i first saw it um and i've smoked fire og the marathon og um pretty much everything that josh has grown i've, I've had and tried yeah beautiful stuff beautiful stuff so there you have it friends what did you think make sure to come back for part two huge 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 thank you to marty again for taking the time to come on the show and a massive shout out to you guys for getting to the end we appreciate you so much just like we appreciate our incredible sponsors if you want to help support the show support our sponsors seeds here now number one seed bank in the industry you know them you love them all the best breeders the hottest drops guarantee on satisfaction not just germination why delay guys i promise you will be stoked if you get some seeds from them they only stock the best in the game Likewise, a massive shout out to our friends at Pulse Sensors, all the best and latest sensors in the game, including their new Pulse Hub, which integrates all of their units together to ensure that your operation is on point, producing bigger yields, better terps, higher potency. Whether you're running a single tent, a single room, or a multi-state operation, Pulse are here to help you guys. Get serious, get a Pulse. Further shout out to Copert, the number one leaders in sustainable biocontrol solutions for pests and disease. If you're battling spider mites, please check out the Spidex Vital sachets. I can't tell you how annoying it is to have to spread carrier material in your garden just to get the predators out. These new sachets circumvent that. Just hang the sachets in your crop, let the persimilis walk out, do the work for you. Trust me guys, you won't look back. You give it one go, you will see the quality, you will be converted. A massive shout out to Copert. We appreciate your support so much. These guys are industry leaders. Check them out. Huge shout out to our friends at Organics Alive, number one for powdered organic fertilizers. If you're thinking about giving organics a go, get on board. Their products make it so easy. Whether you're in veg, transition, or bloom, they've got products that make it easy to dip your toes in the water. Likewise, if you're a seasoned veteran of organics, I promise their products will help take your next crop to a whole new level massive shout out to organics alive they have some of the best products on the market really fast release because they're small particle size you will not go wrong with organics alive hit them up massive shout out and thank you finally a big shout out to our friends at dynavap just a week or two ago they came out with some new models the titanium m series in two different colors you can get yourself the nebulum or the quantum i've been rocking the nebulum i love it guys please give it a go if you've ever tried a vape and felt like it didn't hit the way you were looking for it these ones will truly a game changer based out of the u.s owned in the u.s kind of out truly one of the best vape companies on the market i really really love their products and we are super appreciative of their support massive shout out to dynavap Last but not least, massive shout out to the Patreon gang. Thank you so much for your support. If you want to help ensure the show continues to happen, please consider checking out patreon.com forward slash the podcast. You will get early access to upcoming episodes, unheard exclusive interviews, and you go in the running to win a whole range of swag each month. We give away genetics, cannabis artwork, a whole range of awesome products, all while ensuring the show continues to happen. Again, a massive shout out to the Patreon gang. We love you so 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 much thank you thank you thank you and that's about it for this one my friends i will catch you for the next one thanks so much for hanging out heavy days signing off from the upside down library we'll see you